So here we are at Lowell Observatory with Kevin Schindler, the Outreach Manager, and I'm going to take a tour of the various buildings here. We're going to start at the Saturn Dome, the Rotunda Building, the main building of the Lowell Observatory where the offices and the equipment uh, were kept. Uh, we're going to move on to the, uh, sort of the basement archives, and then we're going to go up the hill and check out the 13-inch dome where Pluto was discovered. When I first came to Lowell Observatory in 2005, I'd written basically the whole book, but without coming to see the places where the book was set. And so it finally dawned on me that I, sh I should actually mm -hmm. come and see where this book was supposedly set. Um, so this is, what is this building here exactly? This is called the Slifer Building after the Slifer Brothers. It was originally built in 1916 to be sort of the main administration building. And it was built just as Percival Lowell passed away, so he didn't get much use out of it. But in this building, um, the library was in this main part, the rotunda, which today is a museum. And on either side, there are wings that were offices. And when Clyde Tama discovered Pluto, he was up on the upper left on the west side. That was his apartment where he lived when he discovered Pluto. So his, his apartment was upstairs, his office was downstairs. The telescope he used to discover Pluto is about 100 yards to the west. So his whole life was centered right within about 100 yards. And just to give a sense of this place, there are several telescopes spread around the top of this uh, area, which is called Mars Hill. This is a big, old Clark telescope here, um, a 24-incher through the trees there, the mirror being 24 inches across, and several others uh, up that way. And over here we have the blink comparator. So this is the sort of the torture device, which <laughs> Clyde Tomba and his fellows, but mostly Clyde, used to really discover the image of Planet X, uh, later called Pluto. Um, here it is behind glass. And if you can see down here, you can see a picture of, of Tombo in his slightly later years uh, at work at the machine. So how does this machine work exactly and what's it for? When they were searching for what was then called Planet X, the idea was that it was something that probably wasn't easily seen. Um, and so what they would do is take a picture in the sky, wait a few days and take a picture of the exact same place and then analyze each picture and see if anything's changed position. Because in a few days' time, distant stars are going to appear in relatively the same position, but something really close to us, like a planet, will change position. So with this, they would put the plates taken a few days apart on each side, and then you would turn this thing on, and what happens is there's a mirror inside. And what you would do is, is, um, is to see a small section of this plate, and then the mirror flips and you see a small section of that plate. You flip back and forth, back and forth, looking at the exact same area of the sky. And in general, everything is going to look the same, but if you have something like a planet, it's going to, be, it's going to change position relative to all the background stars. On a good plate where you're looking at a very dense area of um, stars, you're talking about two or 300,000 dots. And you have to look at every single one to see if it's changed position relative to the other. This is an insane idea, is it not? I mean, to, how today you find computers would do this today. <laughs> but back then, you, you needed somebody like Clyde Tombaugh who was dedicated, who... I, I don't know what made him get bored, but <laughs> well, he was able to see him for hours, going to the telescope and staring through the telescope to guide it, and then doing this he estimated he spent 7,000 hours of his lifetime looking through this very eyepiece. What was, what was their idea of what was out there? Percival Lowell, before he passed away in 1916, he, along with other astronomers, suge had suggested there's a ninth planet out there. And that was based on the irregular movements of Uranus and Neptune. Um, when Uranus was discovered in 1781, um, it, instead of going in its orbit nice and regularly, it seemed to wobble some. Um, per term. And astronomers figured that must be due to some other planet out there whose gravity is pulling on Uranus, calling, causing it to move like that. So when Neptune was discovered in 1846, it didn't seem to account for all those irregular movements. And so astronomers such as Percival Lowell figured there must be yet another planet out there. And so he mathematically calculated where this planet would be located. And then both mathematically doing calculations and then also um, optically using telescopes, he searched for this thing, died in 1916 before he found it, but then in the late 1920s, the astronomers here at BM Slifer um, especially said, you know, Uncle Percy was onto something, 
Let's recommence the search. Um, the vaults are downstairs. The vaults downstairs contain thousands of photographic plates that Clyde Tomba and others used to photograph the night sky looking for Planet X. So we still have those downstairs and we can go down and take a look at them. Let's go. Cool. So I remember coming down here and I came out to do research and here is everything. Here are all the old, these are all the old big 14 by 17 this Plates is all of Clyde the... Tombaugh's legacy right here, and some other astronomers. He, when the observatory started searching for Planet X, they used different telescopes through the year starting in 1905. And we have all those photographic plates back here, smaller ones that were used on the 24-inch Clark, the 40-inch refractor, or 40-inch reflector, um, several different telescopes. So we have a complete record of the search that started in 1905 and then culminated with the discovery of Pluto. And right up here, plate 165 and 171, um, these are the plates, and these are in, photo, in, uh, in envelopes to protect them, but those are um, the actual plates used to discover Pluto. And if we pull this one out, for instance, here's, here's the original envelope mounted on top of a current acid-free one. Did they think that Planet X was a much larger, a Neptune size? Initially, that was the idea. That was that was the whole idea be, behind the search. It was there was a planet big enough that it had perturbed Uranus and Neptune, causing the wobble. So here's the mystery. So so the the planet X is found basically where Percival Lowell's mathematics suggested it would be. Uh -huh. So it could not have been coincidence. But then they were faced with a kind of paradox, which was that this object that they found appeared way too small to be a perturbing object. That's exactly right. Its first moon was discovered in the 1970s, and when, they dis when you discover a moon, you can tell the mass of the planet based on the motion, and they realized for sure that this planet, there's no way it could account for the irregular movements of Uranus and Neptune, and what turns out is that Percival Lowell's calculations were perfect, but they were based on information that all astronomers had, an estimate that you know Uranus was this big. It wasn't until until several decades later, they realized it was a different size. And different size means <laughs> different effects. And, and in fact, there's, there wasn't these irregular motions that should have been there weren't. And so Percival Lowell made excellent calculations based on erroneous information. And like so many times in science, there's a serendipitous discovery. Um, they never discovered Planet X. Planet X was this large body mm -hmm. that perturbed Uranus and Neptune. In the search for Planet X, they happened to find the solar thing that we know today as Pluto. <laughs> I mean, it's just a great story that the work was meticulous, and yet, it, you know, if, if we knew today, um, if they knew t back then what we know today, they never would have looked for it. So it's almost as though, I mean, when I was writing this part of the book and figuring out that this you know, basically coming to the understanding that this is what had, had happened, that Lowell's math was right, but based on erroneous assumption, mm -hmm. that Tomba had found this thing, which was, a, which was too, much too small mm -hmm. to perturb the orbits. It, 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 I mean, it's a kind of a creepy story in a way, um, for me as a novelist, because you begin to feel like, okay, so Percival Lowell, who had his kooky ideas mm -hmm. about civilizations on Mars and such things like that, it's almost as though he, and I know this is, this is, I'm speaking to a scientist, <laughs> but it's almost as though he intuited the presence of, or, or somehow discussed, it's almost as though he drew the knowledge of this object um, out, of this, out of the thin desert air. Named for Pluto. There you go. So, <laughs> there we go. Yeah. So here is one file of letters and telegrams that came into the observatory suggesting different names for the planet. Pluto really was appropriate because the god of the underworld, the most distant cold region, that makes sense because Pluto, the planet is, or whatever we call it today, is so far away. And also um, Pluto has two brothers, Jupiter and Neptune, that were in the solar system. Mm -hmm. And then all, this, all the planets have scientific abbreviations. Mars is a circle with the arrow pointing up. 
um, Venus circle with the cross pointing down. And for Pluto, they decided to use a combination of the first two letters, P and L, for Pluto, and also Percival Lowell's initials, uh, which was a nice tribute to his hard work. Even though he didn't live to see the discovery, it was a nice link to his his pursuit of discovering this planet. You notice on the front gates, you put an asterisk right above the the PL symbol on the front gates leading up into the observatory. Yes. So it's, it's a planet sort of with an asterisk. It's... You know, today it's officially known as the dwarf planet. May or may not change in the official eyes. Everybody has, all scientists, you know, there's so many different opinions about it. In 2006, when the news sort of broke that they were uh -huh. demoting Pluto or re reclassifying right. it, I thought, I thought, what worse thing could happen while I'm writing a book about Pluto, the planet? And then I realized, in fact, this is interesting. It this created controversy. People are interested. They're going to be, they're going to learn about it. Yes. Here's the apartment Clyde Tombaugh lived in when he discovered Pluto. And this is just on the west wing of the main building. And so he lived up here. His office was nearly directly below us. He had to walk about 100 yards to take pictures in the Pluto telescope dome. And then he developed it in the basement of this building. The photographs that Pluto was discovered on uh, were taken, as you say, about 100 yards up the hill here. And in a little bit, we can go up and see where that all happened. So they didn't make this from a kit. This is, this is, this all is very much home, homemade. homemade. Yeah. And, and what's so great is, I mean, you can look at the sutures on the telescope and, um, and how it was put together, and you can say, okay, that's homemade, but it was exactly what they needed. Yeah. They needed something to take wide angle pictures of the sky where they could survey the sky. Um, and collect these photographic glass plates, and this was exactly what they needed. It was really the perfect instrument and the best one on the planet at the time for doing this kind of work. Is that right? It was. It was exactly what they needed, and not, there were, wasn't anybody else really doing this sort of yeah. thing. And so it was perfect for what they needed. They they designed and built it in house, and um, you know it's still in usable condition today. Check it out. So the inside of this space has a, has a, a barn-like, quiet, intimate kind of feeling. Um, and this is, this is the dome, I suppose you would call it, of the observatory. It's more of a, like an upside-down paper cup uh, in shape. And the, the, the roof moves, right? Yeah, the roof moves um, because if you look this way, where all these ropes are, you would open those doors, and that's how you see the night sky. You're not going to take the whole roof off. That would take a long time. You open these doors. Once they're open, you can rotate the dome around to look at any part of the sky. It's a vertiginous feeling to be in here and looking straight up as the whole world seems to revolve one way than the other. And it sounds kind of like a barn being driven down a road. It's got a shaky, timbery, squeaky sound. It's just such a treat to come back and see these places um, again and to see them. It's strange to see them again after having written about them imaginatively and looking at pictures online and so on, but to actually rearrange the spaces in real space uh, and to see where uh, the people that I imagined for so long actually stood and walked and went about their business. So um, it's a real treat. Thanks for having us. And That's great to have you here. Thanks for letting us poke around.